One of Claude Monet's haystack paintings just sold a couple years ago for $97 million at a Sotheby's auction. Wow. In this video, you'll see me try to replicate one of Monet's most famous paintings ever, water lilies and Japanese bridge. You're gonna learn about Monet's techniques and it's gonna make you a better painter. And along the way, we'll learn some fun, interesting historical facts about the water lily paintings as well as his life. What better way to start off this Monet painting than having my daughter, Kate, do the wash. This is a very emotional moment for me. Hey, if you're new here, my name is Terry. My passion is plain air painting and enjoying God's beauty outdoors. So I took the Claude Monet challenge because I wanted to learn from one of the greatest, the greatest impressionists to ever live. And I know after painting this painting, it's gonna make me a better painter. And I think it's gonna make you a better painter. So why don't you take the Claude Monet challenge? Replicate a painting from one of your masters that you admire or take up the Claude Monet challenge with the water lily painting itself. See how you do and see what you learn. So here we go. Chapter one, Monet's technique. I've got six points here on Monet's technique. These are going to be super helpful for you, I think. Here we go. All right, as we mix up some colors here to get started in the drawing stage, let's go over chapter one, Monet's technique. Point number one is broken color. An impressionist technique that involves putting multiple layers of color on top of each other in individual brush strokes, allowing the first layers to show through. Also, these brush strokes are purposefully placed side by side with space in between them, as opposed to fully blending colors or over mixing colors in an area of your painting. This technique created the illusion of light in the plain air painting as colors bounced off one another. Point number two, the impressionist process. The impressionist created the wet into wet a la prima technique. At the time, the process was to paint a layer, let it dry, then paint another layer and repeat this process until the painting was finished with a nice smooth surface. It took a long time to make a painting back then. Wet over dry. Painting over dry painting. It's a known fact that Monet would labor over some of his plein air pieces back in his studio, so this was a form of wet over dry painting technique. Similarly, he would go back to the same painting location under the same lighting conditions repeatedly and paint wet over dry until he was satisfied with the painting. Point number three, direct observation. Observing and painting nature, light, and atmosphere was totally a new thing. Paint what you see, not what you know was foundational to the Impressionist style. Describing the sensation or feeling evoked by the landscape at that moment was why the Impressionists ventured out of their studios in the first place. Studying Monet's short video clip here, we can see that he looked sideways from the canvas to his scene about every three seconds or so over a period of 30 seconds. During that time, at least, he spent more time observing than he did painting. Very interesting. Also, as just mentioned, he was known to stop painting when the fleeting effects of light changed, coming back multiple times under similar lighting conditions to finish the painting. Some plein air painters practice this exact method today and it shows the differing opinions in the growing modern plein air community. Some painters view plein air painting as a tool in the box, so to speak, to improve their studio works. And the painting itself is not to be considered a finished piece of artwork. It's used as reference material for studio paintings or not used at all with just the experience of direct observation and quick color mixing skills gleaned from the plein air painting experience. Others consider plein air painting to be a finished work unto itself whether completed in one session or multiple sessions. To these painters, it might be okay to touch up a plein air piece back in the studio just a little bit, but they take pride in a painting primarily finished in the field and draw a very hard line between the purpose and primary outcome of studio work and actual plein air artwork. My teacher, Don Solly, always used to say, show me the bug stuck in your paint and I'll believe it was painted on plein air. I always thought that was funny. To this point of repeated plein air sessions on the same painting, Claude Monet made art history by painting the same motif, hay bales, under different lighting conditions in varying times of the year and exhibiting them all together. That was totally a new thing. Point number four, brush size. Direct observation from this video of Claude Monet shows that he held five to six brushes in his hands while painting his water lilies, one for each color, as opposed to cleaning and using the same brushes. He was known for using large filberts. Looking closely at this video from 1914, three of the brushes at least are very pointy. Perhaps they're worn out? We'll never really know. Point number five, palette. Monet's palette may have been based more on what he could afford or borrow off his impressionist friends than strategic choice. In the book Paint Like Monet, James Hurd suggests Monet use the following pigments. Lead white, similar to titanium white. Chrome yellow, similar to cad yellow light. Cad yellow, 
Viridian Green, Emerald Green, French Ultramarine Blue, Cobalt Blue, and Matter Red, similar to Alizarin Crimson. Grays and Darks were made by mixing complementary colors. Monet started out using black, but later he took it off his palette completely. Point number six, brush strokes. Monet's brush strokes were energetic, quick, meant to capture light, atmosphere, and impressions of the scene at the moment in time from the view of the artist. Thick impasto brush strokes to go quickly and catch the light, but also to create texture and light effects on the canvas. Again, this technique was new and frowned upon by the art experts. In the video footage painting of the water lilies, he held the brush at the very end in a relaxed fashion and stood arm's length away from the canvas. In the water lily painting, his brush strokes are at times smooth and long, going from left to right, and at other times forceful as he actually pushes against the canvas. After a few strokes, he would dip the brush back into the paint and apply a few more strokes. Rainbow effect. He would sometimes under, under mix two or three colors and throw it down in one brush stroke, creating a visual lighting effect, or what some may call now happy accidents. Chapter two, what I learned. This was the whole point of the Monet challenge. I got eight points here, and I've already started to implement some of these learnings into my newer paintings. I think these will be super helpful for you as well. Well, I'm so glad I did this Monet challenge. I really learned more than I thought I would, actually. Point number one, the attention to detail. Impressionism is not a hurried mess, as some viewers might think. In this water lily painting, for example, we see colors under the water, sky reflections, shadows on the water, and shadows on the lily pads. When I was painting this, the lily pads seemed to have layers or sections from near to far, receding off to the distant trees. He must have painted every single water lily in the pond. There seemed to be hundreds of them, but they were treated sometimes as individual water lilies, and at other times, broad brush strokes were used to portray groups of them. I couldn't fit the water reflections at the far end of the pond in. By the time I was done, my paint was mostly dry and thick, and compositionally, I just fell short in that far off section there of the painting. So I learned that I can put more thought into every stroke of my colors and values in hopes of capturing a more meaningful impression of my subject matter. Point number two, layering. Monet used dry brush technique or wet over dry in this painting. Studying his brush strokes up close, it appears to me that he went out and painted under many different sittings. Again, I felt overwhelmed at how many brush strokes and different colors there were in each area of the painting. I learned here that painting an area in my composition in a smooth, overmixed color is not as interesting to me as showing different layers of colors and values. Point number three, broken color technique. As mentioned, and this is a big one, super cool visual lighting effects can be achieved by placing multiple layers of color on top of each other with individual brush strokes, allowing the first layers to show through, creating the illusion of sparkling light as colors bounce off each other. I learned again that there was a method to the impressionist madness of being obsessed with capturing light, and this can be achieved through purposefully placed brush strokes of differing color and value. Point number four, color harmony throughout the painting. The various greens and violets were the dominant colors and he carried them all around the canvas in unique ways to create visually pleasing balance. With this, I learned to take colors that are in the background and bring them into the foreground and vice versa to achieve visually appealing harmony for the viewer. Point number five, contrast. Monet's use of complementary color red in a heavy green painting provides some interest and balance. Rose matter and cad red were used in the water lilies and in the plant life under the water to achieve contrast. Similarly, constant side-by-side -side use of light and dark, warm and cool, bouncing off one another to convey light and atmosphere made this painting very, very interesting to look at. I learned here that creating contrast in all three atmospheric layers of the foreground, middle ground, and background creates visual interest to the viewer's eye and leads you back through the painting to want to explore it further. Point six, dedication. Monet probably was a little too obsessed with his painting and had an unhealthy family art balance, in my humble opinion, as uh, evidenced by the painting excursions lasting several months away from his home. However, what I can learn from Monet is that if you want to improve your plein air painting skills, it takes time, dedication, practice, observation, and study. And, you know, just how he persevered through the heavy criticism toward his paintings, it just amazes me. We as artists are hard enough on our own selves, let alone you know, having so-called art experts laughing and belittling his paintings. And I can't imagine how he didn't quit. Extremely inspiring. Don't listen to the critic within 
or outside of you. Keep on painting. Point number seven, light and shadow. This painting is all about light and shadow. Monet is only interested in the play of light and shadow on different objects. You can put every object in the painting in either one of the two categories, light or shadow. He was meticulous about how the light hit every single area of the painting. Also, he was unafraid to push the color boundaries with bold color choices leaning on the side of pure, unmixed pigments. I learned the nice effect is to have an object in shadow and then have the light hit part of that object as it comes out from shadow, such as on the bridge, where you see the light and shadow there, and on the vines in the background. Extremely powerful effect. Point number eight, colors. Colors were not terribly hard to mix in this painting, really. I used a ton of ultramarine blue, cad yellow, and emerald green. But the hardest color was the cooler bluish green color of the vines dangling down, and that same color reflected in the water. That was a tough one to nail. I feel like my color mixing was off on that object, on those parts of the paintings, but you know, there was not a lot of neutral colors or earth tones really in this painting that I noticed. Mostly pure pigment leaning either toward warm or cool. And that's why it's such a visually attractive painting. When I used a very limited palette, some estimate between six to nine colors and very vivid colors uh, with no earth tones. It's making me rethink my palette as I have more than 13 colors currently. I learned that you can achieve some very nice color harmony by limiting the paints on your palette. Chapter three. What made Monet unique? Let's take a little art history lesson here. I think you'll find this very fascinating. Claude Monet was not necessarily the first plein air painter, but certainly the figurehead or founder of the Impressionist style of plein air painting movement. He was arguably the most prolific plein air Impressionist painter ever. Claude Monet spearheaded the plein air painting movement. Wow, amazing to think about really. For Claude Monet, it was all about light, color, and painting real life. Monet was a bit of a rebel, though. He dropped out of formal art school. He hated creating formulaic artwork, copying the art that hung in the Louvre, as well as painting scenes from ancient Greek and Roman myths that was popular and accepted at the time. Monet created a community with other frustrated artists, a group that included Pierre Auguste Renoir, Camille Pissarro, Edgar Degas, Paul Cezanne, and Frédéric Bazille. The group called itself the Anonymous Society of Painters, Sculptors, and Printmakers. Painting outside instead of a studio was unheard of at the time. Painting life as it was, instead of historical figures, was a disgrace to the establishment. Painting thick and freely, with an emphasis on color and light, was despicable. Instead of implementing textbook, symmetrical composition with clean lines and a baby bottom smooth surface to your painting. Because of this, these artists were banned from participating in the Salon de Paris, the most prestigious art event in the 18th century held annually. Monet was the kid who colored outside the lines. Monet's work was heavily criticized by art experts and the establishment for most of his career. They belittled him. The newspapers and critics called the Impressionist paintings messy. Outraged art critic Louis Leroy said this about Monet's painting, Impression Sunrise, quote, Impression! Wallpaper in its most embryonic state is more finished, end quote. They said the Impressionists could not draw and that their colors were vulgar. For me, you know, this perseverance through all that criticism makes his efforts and legacy even more unbelievable. The French painter, Monet, manipulated light and shadow to portray landscapes in a groundbreaking way, upending the traditional art scene in the late 19th century. He was the founding father of Impressionism. He did something new and different and created a way of painting that people to this day are still learning in mass numbers. Unbelievable. Monet's method of painting was to paint a series of paintings. Monet returned to the same view under different weather and light conditions. He was a true student and observer of nature, sometimes working on eight or more canvases in the same day. Monet's obsession to capture ever-shifting atmospheric conditions came to be a hallmark of the Impressionist style. Monet sometimes got disgusted with his work. According to some reports, he destroyed a number of paintings. Estimates range as high as 500 paintings were destroyed. Monet would burn, cut, and kick paintings he was frustrated with. In addition to these outbursts, he was known to suffer from bouts of depression and self-doubt. Yeah, I can relate to that, bro. Chapter four, fun facts about the water lilies. Some of these facts are absolutely fascinating. Take a listen. Point number one, water lilies is not one painting by Monet. The title water lilies refers to a series of paintings by Claude Monet, it's not just one painting. Over the course of the series, it is estimated that Monet painted 250 oil paintings of his beloved water lily pond. Point number two, Monet considered himself an enthusiastic gardener. Monet, a passionate horticulturist, 
purchased the land intending to build something, quote, for the pleasure of the eye and also for motifs to paint, end quote. It took me some time to understand my water lilies. I had planted them for the pleasure of it. I grew them without ever thinking of painting them, end quote. Claude Monet. Maybe it'll happen with me and my wife's squash and zucchini garden. I can picture it now. The zucchini series. Yeah, I don't think so. When he wasn't painting the plant life on his property, Monet was remodeling its landscapes and gardens to better inspire his plein air work. Or, as Monet himself said, quote, I'm good for nothing except painting and gardening, end quote. Basically, he created the perfect place for quiet reflection, then spent the rest of his days capturing it in plain air oils. Wow, sounds nice. Point number three. The city council tried to kill Monet's water lilies. Claude Monet imported water lilies for his Giverny garden from Egypt and South America, which angered the local authorities. They demanded he uproot the plants before they poisoned the area's water, but Monet ignored them. Yeah, way to go, Claude. Point number four. Monet's Japanese footbridge was painted often. When you see this water lily painting, it's so immediately recognizable as a Monet, in part due to the Japanese bridge. In 1899, Monet completed the setting of his pond despite the neighbor's protests. Over the water, he built a quaint Japanese-style bridge like the one we see here. Monet loved to paint this bridge. He painted it 17 times that very year, with each painting reflecting changes in lighting and weather conditions. Point number five. Some water lily paintings were destroyed in a fire. In 1958, a terrible fire broke out at the Museum of Modern Art. While many paintings were saved, six were damaged. And two of these were recently acquired water lily paintings. The loss devastated art lovers who sent sympathy letters to the museum. In 1959, Museum of Modern Art got another crack at owning part of the series when it acquired a massive water lilies triptych. Point number six, Monet destroyed his own paintings. As mentioned earlier, sometimes the painter's passion turned violent. <laughs> in 1908, Monet destroyed 15 of his water lilies right before they were to be exhibited at the Durand Ruelle Gallery in Paris. Apparently, the artist was so unhappy with the paintings that he decided to ruin them rather than have the work go on public display in the gallery. <laughs> um, can you picture the father of Impressionism lighting fire to his paintings and smashing them on a tree and then frisbee tossing them across the pond? Point number seven, Monet's large water lily paintings were an innovative visual experience. In 1918, Monet completed a series of 12 paintings he intended to be laid out side by side in a specially made oval room where viewers could step in and be given, as he put it, quote, the illusion of an endless hole of water without horizon or bank, end quote. Monet said these were meant to create, quote, the refuge of a peaceful meditation in the center of a flowering aquarium, end quote. Today, Three such panels, displayed as a triptych, are on display at the New York Museum of Modern Art, measuring more than 6 by 41 feet. As Museum of Modern Art curator Anne Tempkin explains, in early Impressionism you had these views of nature where you were out looking at a seaside or out looking at a field and there were markers of location that you could understand. Here I am as a person. Here's the view that the painter is portraying for me. But with the water lily, triptych panels, he's changed it completely so that rather than you being larger than the view that you're looking at on an easel sized canvas, somehow you have become immersed in the scene of this water lily pond. All the normal markers like the edge of the water or the sky or the distant trees have disappeared and you're just right in the face of those water lilies and the surface of the water with the clouds reflected from above. You become lost in this expanse of water and light. Isn't that such a creative cool composition idea by Monet. Point number eight, Monet hired people to clean his water lilies. From 1883 until his death in 1926, Monet lived in Giverny, a village in northern France. Apparently the beauty of the French village, Giverny, struck Monet when he passed through on a train. And being so inspired, in 1833 he rented a house there. It would later become his home in 1890. But over the years, he hired gardeners to plant everything from poppies to apple trees in his garden, turning it into a beautiful, tranquil place for him to paint his plein air paintings. Finally, wealthy from the sales of his paintings, Monet began investing time and money into his precious garden. As Monet's garden expanded, he hired six full-time employees to tend it. One gardener's job was to paddle a boat onto the pond each morning, washing and dusting each lily pad. Once the lilies were clean, Monet began painting them, trying to capture what he saw as the light reflected off the water. Seriously? Okay, that's a little weird, don't you think? Point number nine. 
Around 1908, when he was in his late 60s, Monet began having trouble with his vision. Diagnosed with cataracts in 1912, he later described his inability to see the full color spectrum. Quote, Reds appeared muddy to me, pinks insipid, and the intermediate or lower tones escaped me. End quote, Monet. When he became legally blind in 1922, he continued painting by memorizing the locations of different colors of paint on his palette. See, this is exactly why I teach my students to put your paints in the same place on your palette every time. In case you go legally blind, it could happen. Monet delayed getting risky cataract surgery until 1923, though, and critics mocked him for his blurry paintings, suggesting that his impressionistic style was due to his failing vision rather than his artistic brilliance. After two cataract surgeries, Monet wore tinted glasses to correct his distorted color perception and may have actually been able to see ultraviolet light. Wait, this guy painted $80 million masterpiece paintings half blind? New respect level for Claude Monet here? Um, critics suggested his works were less about a creative vision than Monet's blurred vision. As his eyes were failing, critics sneered at Monet's color palette and his argument that his depiction of flora, water, and light was an artistic choice, spurring an initial disdain of Monet's now revered series. Point number 10, the famous water lily paintings were not an instant hit. For 20 years following Monet's death in 1926, his Water Lily series was largely ignored, with many paintings sitting forgotten in his Giverny studio. Wow, can you imagine? Largely ignored? <laughs> Sounds like my paintings. Chapter 5, Quotes from Monet. These are inspirational, encouraging quotes, I think, for you from the master himself. Let's take a listen. And this video is sponsored by myself. Click the link below to get the best YouTube video on beginner planner setup and supplies. It's free and you'll get periodic emails for tips, techniques, freebies, and giveaways. Well, that double dog dare you to take the Monet challenge like I did. If you learn at least one thing to help your painting, it'll be so worth it. But don't forget to subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications for all future videos because you're going to want to join us on our outdoor plein air adventures in the high mountains of Colorado every week for tips, techniques, and inspiration to help you as a beginner plein air painter. Hey, thanks for watching. God bless. You take care.